Considering that we just finally had some rain, the Bible says in Job that he makes it rain on the crops and gives water to the earth. And just like physical rain, it brings refreshing and cooling. It brings life, too. And for some of us, it's just an inconvenience. For some of us, like Dale, who's probably singing in the fields today, it's, uh, it, it, it's really, it really is life. It's, it's one way God gives us uh, that refreshing and that restoring, but it brings uh, seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So he also, he also gives us a, a, spiritual, there's a spiritual interpretation for the rains from God, too. <coughs> He says, I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. And in the proper season, I will send the showers that they need, showers of refreshing and of life. So let's keep that in mind as we continue to worship him and give him thanks and praise for the physical showers that cool and refresh us, but for the showers of his spirit that refresh our souls.
realized my goodness. And, and I always had that vision of that was a puppy. And goodness was chasing us wherever we went. But when God says, you know, I am chasing you. Amen. Just so envision God, big God, chasing after you. And he doesn't care what he looks like. He wants to catch you with his goodness. Because when his goodness gets on you, it changes you. So, you know, once in a while, it just stops and can get it.
convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life, angels or principalities, nor things present and threatening or things to come, no power, no height, no depth, nor any other thing created will ever be able to separate us from the unlimited God, love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 All right, kiddos, if you are between the ages of 4 and 12, come see me, please. Not up on the stage, just right here in front of the stage. Turn and face all. You guys, give this worship team a hand. Ages 4 to 12, come on. Turn and face the adults. Feet on the floor, sweet boy. Nice jump, though. That was impressive. I could not do that. Feet on the floor. Do you guys remember, what are we learning about right now in Children's Church? You are a <laughs> masterpiece. <laughs> you are a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. You got everybody, extend your hands to our kiddos here. Thank you, Jesus, for this generation. We thank you for the children that you've entrusted to us to, to, to raise. We know it takes a village to raise a, these children. And so we just thank you, God, that you've given all of them to all of us. Jesus, we thank you that you've entrusted us with them. And we just pray that we would be good stewards of, of parenting, of, of grandparenting, of being friends and mentors, pastors and and examples of what it looks like to be a worshiper. We just thank you, Jesus, that we get this beautiful opportunity to speak into these children's lives. And I pray that today as they go to Children's Church, that they would be touched by the Holy Spirit in a brand new and fresh way. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, here's your assignment. All the kids, here's your assignment. Listen in. Go find the adult that you came with and show them how to get you checked in. Okay, on your mark. Get set. I don't think these four boys heard me. Go find the adult you came with and show them how to get checked in. <laughs> he's not lying, my own son. He's, he's, it's my own son. My own son. Can we just praise Jesus for teenagers? Just thank you for teenagers who give moms and dads extra hands. Thank you, Eden. <laughs> All right, Monday nights. How many of you have been joining Bible Blitz with Bruce? I have been. Sean has been. I know Pam has been. Kristen has been. It's really, really good, you guys. It's really good. It's really fun. Bible Blitz with Bruce is Monday nights at 7. This week we are on Hebrews 5. Bruce's goal is that you would come with questions that stump him. Bring it, right? Yeah. So um, look for the Zoom link on Facebook or on our website to... to um, Join Bible Blitz and weekly, Women's Weekly on Thursday nights. That also has been a lot of fun. We're going through the book of Victorious Emotions. Um, it's okay if you haven't read any part of it yet. Just join us. Just pop in. It's really fun. Do we have books left? Awesome. So if you still need your book, Victorious Emotions book, the, the church purchased some, and you can purchase it from the church. See Mona, the lovely, lovely lady in Lyme. All right, you guys, Bill and Tracy Vanderbush, they're coming back. Woohoo! We love them so much. They're coming on Monday, August 15th. So I know that's a weird time, but Monday, August 15th, here at 6 o'clock, um, it's going to be really good. Bill, Bill and Tracy just are so fun. They're so powerful. So please try to make an effort to be here for that. And then, listening ears turned on. This is a big one. August 28th, we're not having church here. We're going to do an outdoor service and Higgins Annual Backyard Barbecue at my house, August 28th, okay? <laughs> so we're gonna do, so we're gonna start at 11 with our, our outdoor service. Um, I don't know if Sean is gonna be like speaking from the deck and everybody's like <laughs> below on the ground. We haven't figured out the logistics exactly, but 11 o'clock, Sunday, August 28th. The church is providing all of the meat we're going to grill, and then you guys are going to do all the side dishes, dish past, desserts, so on and so forth. See Alicia if you have any questions. Lovely Alicia, give them a wave. See Alicia if you have any questions, sign up sheets, all the things. Oh. oh. <laughs> we'll, just put, we'll just put Sal in charge of all of that. Sal in charge of all of that. 
Oh goodness, it's lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, our tithes and offerings. You guys are a generous bunch. You know, we look like we're, we look pretty small, but we have, make a big splash. When Sean and I were on a tr- on a trip this last week, and we stopped early every night because we were traveling with my brother and his kids too. So in total, we had six kids. 12 of us total and there were six kids. So so we stopped early every night so that we could like lure them ahead with a pool at the end of the night, you know. So we're going to the hotel and the thing was cannonball after cannonball after cannonball and who can I splash the most? Sean, you would have fit right in. Just like cannonball after cannonball. That's what this little place does. We just make big splashes and we just keep going cannonball after cannonball after cannonball. And what you give is our soldiers in the kingdom we we take everything we're able to and we give it away to advance the kingdom and keep being generous and keep splashing the community around us so keep being generous people um it's good for you it's good for them it's good for all y'all all of us so just keep keep it a heart of generosity there's all the ways to give i lost my voice on that set so my voice is like <laughs> it's a winner when you don't have a voice at the end yeah um so we've got baskets here there's venmo paypal uh, text to give all the things so um, keep being generous. If you have your tithes and offerings with you, just hold, hold it up. Or if you got your phone, if you're a text to giver, hold it out in front of you. And we just say, Jesus, we offer you our sacrifice of finances. We thank you, God, that you give us finances in order to be a blessing through that. We know that we're just, we're just the fire hose, right? So you just send it through us. So we're blessed to be a blessing. And we thank you for that. We bless your finances today as you give in Jesus' name. Amen. Sean Michael Higgins. Fire. Well, it kind of looks like that FBI warning at the front of all the videos. Real, like, there's something about that that's not inviting. Like, sorry for whoever made it. It got CJ up here, at least. Awesome. Well, who enjoyed Bruce last week? Yes, yes. For the uh, podcast or whatever's going on back there, a lot of people raise their hands. So people listening, I'd be like, wow, nobody, huh? Um, no, I listened to it. It was great. It's always an honor to be able to have so many teaching pastors here at Living Word. Um, one of these days we're going to get Eric Robo up here, but he doesn't know it yet. So. <laughs> awesome. So I was in Texas, uh, Took the culture a little too seriously. Got myself some chicken fried brisket. Don't recommend it. It was horrible. I just, I dove right in. Biscuits and gravy, chicken fried chicken, Dr. Pepper barbecue sauce. I thought, let's, yeah, I know. It's weird. I think of all the food I was eating down there would have tasted a lot better in like February rather than when it was 104 in Texas. I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like how much, does every meal come with gravy? It's like almost like, I imagine you go to church down there and the communion wine is gravy. I mean, that's just that's like, what is with these people and gravy? White gravy, brown. They're like, you want white gravy? You want brown gravy? And you're like, I don't want any gravy. And then they look at you like, there's like a charge on your tab. No gravy, five bucks. It's like, what the heck? Yeah, so we had a lot of fun. It was an absolute blessing to go down and sit with a 90-year-old um, and ask questions and hear about Libby's heritage and her, meet her West Texas family. West Texas is not a part of America. It is a whole other group. I just was like, where am I? You know, we're in plain view, and that name is like exactly what you see, like nothing. It's like... There's no rivers, there's no lakes, there's gravy everywhere. (laughs) People are, everyone talks so, I mean, I don't even want to get into it. In case Libby's family's watching, I love you guys. But it is a whole different, whole different place out there. So I'm excited to be back though. You know, I've been kind of on this series. Uh, We started with Zerubbabel. This is a lot about 
changing the way we think. It's almost a renewing of your mind series. So we started with Zerubbabel, and what Zerubbabel was doing was he was in the middle of two different groups of people, and he wasn't taking into consideration what they had to say about the incident. They were He was doing what God called him to do. Uh, so, you know, that was a fun message. Then we had the performance-based identity. That was even a funner message. Who en- More fun, right? A more fun message. Who enjoyed that one? That one was great. Uh, if you haven't heard these, they're available online. But that was about, uh, you know, we find a lot of our identity in our performance, and that's not good. So let's just say that's not good. Say that's not good. Yeah, we're not going to do that. And then we start to make transactions with God. So that's what that was about. Today it's about getting rid of um, old ways of thinking, traditions, and the need for familiarity. Oh, no. Yes. Scary stuff. Um, Title of today's message is Put Down the Stick. Which I wasn't thinking about this, but when I was in the drum cage, I remembered there were several stories about people from down there that had to go like get their own switch when they were in trouble so it's not the stick we're talking about (laughs) no we didn't have that's not us all right so we're going to be talking about moses who here loves moses good old mo yes and we're in Exodus 17, and so to kind of put you in the place where we are in the whole biblical story is Adam and Eve. I love to do this with you guys. Adam and Eve, they've gone. They ate the apple. They screwed up. We're past them. Noah made the boat, built the ark. We're past him. Abraham was called to a distant land. He had Isaac and Jacob. Jacob had his 12 sons. They lived in Egypt for 400 years in which they became slaves. And this takes place shortly after they left uh, Egypt. So Moses splits the Red Sea, uh, the 10 plagues come, and now they're wandering around in the wilderness. You guys with me? You've all seen Prince of Peace by DreamWorks, right? You know where we are. Oh, Prince of Egypt, dang it, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yeah, Moses was not the Prince of Peace. Okay, so what's going on here in this story is Moses has, rocked Egypt's world did a lot there was a lot of plagues that came down Egypt decided the Pharaoh decided hey we're gonna let God's people go they crossed the Red Sea and now they're out in the wilderness and as they're in the wilderness um, this is this is where it takes place and it goes like we're, we're gonna start in Exodus 17 uh, verse 1 through 7 I think it's up I like the BSB one of my new favorite translations so then it says Then the whole congregation of Israel left the desert of Sin, moving from place to place as the Lord commanded. They they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the people contended with Moses, give us water to drink. Uh, Why do you contend with me, Moses replied? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted for water there and they grumbled against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. First and foremost, I just want to point out, I don't think Moses brought them out of Egypt by gunpoint. I feel like they were pretty, like they made the conscious decision to follow him. Nobody made them cross the Red Sea. So right off the bat, the people are blaming their leader. Things aren't going well, so they're blaming Moses, right? And that's a pretty common thing in leadership. I mean, we all have had jobs where we're under management and things aren't going right in management and you start to say, these guys have no idea what they're doing. (laughs) And then you complain and you complain and you complain. And one of my favorite things to tell people who complain about their job is, this is America. You don't have to work there. You're not a slave to this corporation. Like, if you don't like your job, why are you there? It's just like these people. Well, why have you taken us out of Egypt? You didn't have to come. You could have stayed a slave. You didn't have to leave, but they're pretty pumped to leave, in fact. So, but now tables have turned. They've come up against a problem. They're out of water. Well, that is a pretty big deal. If I was out of water, I'd be kind of scared too. But we like to, you know, you like to put this in context of what's going on. They have just watched the Nile turn to blood. They've watched, uh, they, they painted the blood of the lamb over their doorposts and the spirit of death passed over. They, the, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt allowed them to leave and gave them all the gold. They walked through the Red Sea, parted. They saw ocean on each side of them. And then when they got to the other side, they crashed in on the Pharaohs. These are not just regular people griping for water. 
they've seen a lot of stuff. It's interesting because all they're focused on is their next problem. All they have in their vision is the next miracle that needs to be solved. And I, I don't, we don't do that, do we? Ever? My marriage is better than it's ever been. I got a great job. The money showed up when I needed it. I've been sober for five years. My whole life turned around. But my electrical bills do. But I just lost my temper on my kids. But oh, man, wait, we do this stuff. See, we, we like to think we're Moses, you know what I mean? But don't kid yourself, you're the Israelites too. You can't play both sides. You like to be David when he comes out with the sling and hits Goliath and kills his giant. But you dang well might have been one of the dudes on the line that was scared to go out and fight him in the first place. Don't always put yourself as the hero in the Bible. This is a multifaceted thing. You get to play all characters in this deal. Just like Peter, I'll never betray you, Lord. Yeah, right. The, the, the thing that, that breaks my heart in the middle of that, though, is that we do complain in the middle of miracles. We do complain in the middle of breakthrough. Because if I told all of you out there, has God been good? You're going to say, yeah, he's been great. And then I'm going to share all the disappointments I know about what happened in your life. But you're still going to say God's good when you look back at the past. But when you look to the future and see all your problems that you're facing, you're going to say, I don't know if he's going to show up again. Moses, did you bring me out here to die? I was safer back in Egypt. I don't want to face this. It's unfamiliar. I don't want to have to trust in the Lord for my next problem. I just want to live off an old miracle. Know what you're saying? Know what I'm saying? So we're going to go on to verse 4. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What should I do with these people? Yeah, we know no one ever says that in leadership, ever. A little more and they will stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, walk on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take along in your hand the staff which you, which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. And when you strike the rock, water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord God, is the Lord among us or not? A couple things here. I really, this is crucial for the whole message. Moses strikes the rock and water comes out. Who, who's the rock in our life? Jesus. Who was struck for our transgression? Who told the woman at the well, I am living water. If you thirst, or you will thirst no more if you drink from me. Who was stabbed on the cross and water came out of his side as a symbol of the new river flowing from the new Jerusalem that we will always have the liver of, liver, river of life throw, flowing through us. See, Moses, yeah, Moses is right here in the middle of a problem displaying a prophetic act that he has no clue is even happening. He has no clue he's speaking into the future about what's going to happen to Jesus. The rock struck down for our transgressions to release living water that will sustain us for the rest of our life, okay? You hear what's, yeah, you see what's going on here? But the thing about it is Moses is in the middle of like pretty much a life or death situation. He doesn't see God doing this at all. So I want you to really hear that. 75% of the service God is going to, this is just a hypothetical number, but I'd like to believe 75% of the service you're going to do for the Lord, you have no idea is even going on and you will not know until you get to heaven. You're going to be in the middle of this situation that to you feels like life or death, that you're thirsty, you're dry, you need a miracle, and there is so much more going on than you can even see. So much more going on than you can even see. But the cool thing is, is this is all in the Old Testament. We get to live in the New Testament. We got a whole new covenant. We got a new promise from God. And if we would like to, he will allow us to see what's going on even outside of what's naturally happening in front of us. 
Isn't that pretty cool? I don't think you guys are grasping that yet. It's, it's, you don't have to clap. Don't, I don't even know pity claps from Logan Berg in the middle. See, the problem is, is that the only way that you can receive that is through trust. Trust is faith. These Israelites still got water from the rock. They still got to drink. They still had their needs met. And guess what? You will always have your needs met too because God's the sustainer of all things. But whether or not you have peace in the middle of it, joy in the middle of it, righteousness in the middle of it, kindness, gentleness, if you're in a place of rest, all depends on whether you're willing to trust God in the middle of this problem or if you're going to sit and worry about the problem. Because the Israelites had all their needs met, but they never had joy. They never had peace, and they never were okay with what was going on. So externally, things can be going well for you, but internally, you can look just like them. Because God needs that. He needs the trust as a currency. You give him that trust, he then can fill you with peace. You give him that trust, he then can fill you with joy. It ain't a punishment, and it ain't a consequence. It's the currency that allows you to open up so that he can pour into you. But when you don't trust, you close the door. And you can't pour. So when you, I know it's uncommon for us, but Jesus says, narrow is the gate that leads to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not heaven. The Bible is very clear. You can look up the verse. The kingdom of God is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Narrow is the gate that leads to that because you have to come up against something that looks so opposite to what you need and say, God's going to meet that even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't look like it, you're going to end up at a rock. You're going to be dry, you're going to be miserable, and you're going to be thirsty. And you're going to have to believe that with one strike from your rod, there's going to come water because God is on your side. It is. I, it is good. Thank you. I'm very... See, because he wants to... He is on a mission with the Israelites, this, and he's on the same mission with you to prove that he's a good provider, a good protector, a good father, that he loves you, that he has your back. And he, he slowly and gradually gives us a little, and gives us a little, and gives us a little. And he's been giving the Israelites a lot, but he's also given us a lot. And we still come up to that, uh, that rock and say, I don't know if I'm going to get water this time. Do you know how absurd it is to believe that God is going to let you die in the place that he brought you? What, what kind of good father is that? I've made it this far in my life only so I could fall flat on my face. And what do we, the thing is, is the lies we believe about like, not only are we just not going to be happy, but we're going to lose our job and end up under a bridge and I, everything's going to collapse. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my family. I mean, how many think so stupid thoughts sometimes? Exactly. And it never happens. But see, what's going on here is a Meribah moment in your life. You end up in a position where you have to ask, is the Lord among me or not? Is the Lord among me or not? This moves us on to a different part of the story now. We're going to be in Numbers 1 to 13. In the first month, the whole congregation of Israel entered the wilderness of Zin and stayed in Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. So that's, they kind of jump over that, but that's Moses' sister. That's, you know, the one who put him in the basket and pushed him and been with him for a long time. So his sister dies. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished with our brothers before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into the wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? This is not a repeat of the same story. This is literally a whole nother incident. They're back at the same place thirsty for water, grumbling. And this time I think they're being a little bit more sarcastic. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly here, Moses? You know, there, there's a little bit of like a condescending tone in that. You know, they're not really, uh, if they really believed they were Lord's assembly, they wouldn't be asking Moses for water. Can I get an amen? amen? 
Why have you led us, and this is how I know, because it goes, why have you led us out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? Is it not a place of grain figs, vines, or, or pomegranates? No, it's not. They're in the desert. There's no grain fig. They, so he's mocking them. Is there anything here for us? And there's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting. That was like the tabernacle. That's, so they went to pray. They went to seek God. They fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will pour out its water. You will bring out water from the rock and provide drink for the congregation in their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had been commanded. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen now, you rebels. So he's a little teed off. You know, he's not in the best state. Listen now, you jerks. <laughs> Must we bring you water out of this rock? If I was in the congregation, I'd say, yeah, I'm pretty thirsty. I need something to drink. <laughs> then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice. God said to speak to it, right? And he struck it twice with his staff so that a great amount of water gushed out and the congregation in their livestock were able to drink. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of Israel, you will not bring the assembly into the land that I have given them. And we go on into Hebrews 3 and 4, and it talks about the, the promised land is actually a place of God's eternal rest, which we get access to today. We all get to enter into God's rest. And what he's saying is, Moses, you didn't trust me, therefore you can't come in. Different covenant, though. See, he's harder on them. Everyone's like, oh, I wish I could go back and be like Moses and David. No, that's a bad covenant. I don't like that covenant. I don't want to live where it's one and done. I like where God's like, you can have a mistake every five seconds and still start over. Are you guys with me on that? Yeah, yeah God's grace in the new covenant is so much better. What's interesting about this is that Moses is in the same situation that he was in previously. The exact same spot. In fact, it says right here, these were the waters of Meribah. He's literally back at Meribah. He's literally back in a situation where he has to decide whether the Lord is among him or not. See, we cycle around those. Man, I'm back in the same failed relationship. I'm back at the, I, I just lost my job. I'm back in fear that my, but my needs are not going to get back. I'm back in a relapse. I'm just getting out of jail. I'm back failing in my diet. I'm back in anxiety. I'm back. I'm back at Meribah. I'm back at the same spot where I have to decide, is the Lord among me in this situation or not? See, because I already had a miracle here. I already had breakthrough in this situation. I already struck the, the rock and water came out. Why, why do I have to do this all over again? Maybe I didn't learn what I needed to learn. Maybe this is just the thorn I'm going to carry for the rest of my life. But the fact of the matter is, is Moses is back in the same spot, just like we end up back in the same issues. You guys following me? Sometimes God removes it for good, and sometimes he gives us grace to endure it for our whole life. Either way, he is still good. Amen. Either way, he is still good. See, that's interesting here, though, is Moses takes his rod. See, all the miracles that Moses had performed, most of them up to this point, have been with the rod. Drop it down, it turns into a serpent. Aaron's rod buds off. Moses touches his rod to the Red Sea. What we don't realize is that Moses had a speech impediment, so for God to ask him to speak to the rock in this moment is actually asking him to, to minister out of his weakness, to call a miracle out of his weakness, and instead he wants to go back to what's comfortable. He wants to go back to what he knows. See, 
I, I know, God, that you've called me to be vulnerable, but I want to go back to the same self-help book that made me feel good two years ago and do it on my own. And God says, no, you need to get in a self-help group and start sharing about what's going on inside of you. No, God, I want that rod. I don't want to go out and use my weakness. I don't want to confront. I don't want to try something harder. I actually want to go back to what was comfortable in my closet by myself and, 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 and to feel... You know what I'm saying? You guys, you guys know what I'm saying? I was baptized five years ago, and when I came out of the water, it felt good, so I'm going to try that again. Yeah. And God's saying, st you're striking the rock with the, with the rod. Yeah. You're taking the rod out, and you're, and you're striking the rock. I I'm calling you for something new. But God, that worked in the past. You're, you showed up in the past when I did that. Yeah, but you're trying to force me to show up by doing it the way you think it should be because you're comfortable and familiar with that method. Don't mistake the method for the master. Let's not give the tortilla chip credit for the flavor the guacamole provides. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? The rod was just the tool. The power was always God. The book, the baptism, the AA group, the, the, the uh, self-help group, the counseling, the time you did it this way, the time you did it that way. It was all the method, not the master, not the power. So he's, he's saying, sometimes I think intentionally goes, that ain't going to work because I, I'll never give you a formula, but I will always give you access to my relationship and there we will find a way out. Yeah. It's hard though. Anybody, anytime I've ever seen growth in my life, because I did it the way I didn't want to, it's not easy. But at the same time, it, it, it is. And it, you guys know what I'm saying? Like, like you look at it and you say, that task is unbearable for me. That, that way that God wants me to do it is completely and utterly terrifying. And then seconds after being on the other side, you feel so good. It's almost like he goes right on the other side of being vulnerable. There's some peace. Right on the other side of trying it this way, there's some joy. All you got to do is just face that giant. In this situation, you get to be David. Take out your sling. Boom. Stop standing on the line, snacking on the cheese tray your brother just bought, and start getting out into the battle. We do some marriage counseling, and one of my favorite things to drop on them is, why, are you a good, why, why should you be a good husband? They say, well, because my wife and this and that. No, because God says you should be a good husband. I go, if you were less focused on being served by your spouse and more focused on serving her in the name of the Lord, a lot of your problems would go away overnight. <laughs> But see, that's, that's, I know it's a two-way street. I know it's a two-way street, but men are called to be the leaders, right? So why don't you try it first? That ain't easy. It ain't easy when you get home and the laundry's not done and you asked her twice yesterday if you could have this shirt clean for your business meeting tomorrow. It's not easy. This shirt ain't been washed in five days. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we can start. Yeah. The, the point is, is that you butt up against this thing where you have every right by worldly standards to say X, Y, and Z about the situation, but God says, why don't you look a little higher? Because on the other side of that is some peace, is some joy, and is some breakthrough. For you and your spouse, for you and your work environment, for you and your boss. If you choose the higher road, do you not trust that I will come in behind you and clean up the mess that everyone's making around you? Do you not trust God in that? Is this a Meribah moment? Are you sitting at the rock wondering if it's going to actually produce water? Are you going to say, is God among me in this situation or not? Or are you going to keep ending up against the same stinking rock, 
dry. You know what they say about being dry and Alcoholics Anonymous? You're miserable. You're a fire hazard. You don't want to, no one wants to be around you. You want to end up dry and, and looking at a rock, wondering if you're going to be able to get some water out of it? No. Or, yeah, no, thank you. Somebody's, somebody's here. But when God calls you in the weakest part of your, of your, uh, uh, of, like you, you look and you say, and here's a cool, here's one I'm going to share with you guys to be a little vulnerable myself. I found out recently, although a lot of people around me knew and my actions led them to believe it, that I actually suffer from low self-esteem. So why would God call me to come up here and speak? And why would God make me a larger than life personality? And why would God put me in the positions he's in if I actually go home and kind of think about it a lot and wonder how much of a fool I made of myself? Because he wants to use our weaknesses to make us stronger. We got this word that was great. It said, you get to use your strengths to be strong and your weaknesses become strong. So your strength plus strength. When you're working with God, your strength plus strength. The weakest part of you is now the strongest part of you in the kingdom of the Lord. I don't want to be vulnerable with those people. I'd rather buy the book and work on it alone. I don't like confrontation. I'd rather just pretend it doesn't bother me. I'm too broke to dream. God told me that. I go, God, no. He goes, you need to talk to those people. I said, I'm going to give them grace. He goes, you're just using grace as an excuse to not be confrontational. He's like, that's not what grace is. I'm too broke to dream about bigger things in my life. I'm not going to talk with those people. I'm too ugly. I'm too stupid. I'm not good looking enough. On the other side of the vulnerability and the confrontation and the risks, the weakness, the discipline, the belief, the stepping out, that's where your rest is. That's where we get to go into the promised land. That's where we get to experience the righteousness, peace, and joy of the kingdom of God. I got a lot of notes today, guys. I've been really working. Do you really? See, here's the thing. The Israelites had their needs met. They got water both times. Even God was still honoring of their basic needs, even when Moses didn't listen. God is the sustainer of all life. He's never going to let you just, he's not going to take the oxygen from the lungs and leave you flat on your face dead. But do you really want to look like you have it all together on the outside when on the inside you're dry and dying? Yeah, water's coming out of the rock. But now you've expelled yourself from that place of rest. You keep coming to the same Meribah situation in your life. We all have them. Some areas of our life, we get in battle, and we know the Lord's got our back, and we have no issues. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, what happens right after the, Moses gets water the first time is they go into battle and they win some battles and they go and we go in and we win some battles and we know the Lord's got us in this situation. But next thing you know, we're back up against that one thing, that one thing that we can't seem to let God rule over. See, because all those other battles on the outside, they still look crappy, but on the inside, we feel peace because we know God's got us. So you come up to another battle that still looks crappy and you don't have peace and that's what's killing you. That's what's killing you. You could just chalk that thing up on the list of all the other battles, step up to go, God's got my back, whether I win, lose, or otherwise, he's there, he's got a better thing for me, boom, we're on our way, let's move forward. But instead, we're passing by this Meribah spot and saying, is the Lord really among me here or not? Is the Lord really in this with me or not? And he's up there going, well, yeah, bud. Did you not see? He, he hit the rock with a stick. Is that not proof enough? And I, could you just imagine? Like, I just get this. He's got it by the very bottom. He's looking at him. You jerks, you really want water? Crack! <laughs> he might have actually split the rock himself. God just made the water come from it. But it's time to leave Meribah for good. 
It's time to leave Meribah and that situation in your life for good. It's time to put it behind you. Because yeah, there's water, and yeah, you got your basic needs met, but God isn't king there yet. And that means you're in dangerous waters. Yeah. Pun intended. You like that how I did that? Yeah. There's water there, but you're in dangerous waters. Preacher joke. So you remember when I was talking about how Jesus was the rock and he was struck for a transgression and water came out of it? So keep that in your mind as we hit this next part because you have two options. Pick up the stick and do it by your own might and try to get Jesus to move or talk to the rock. Talk to the rock. You can work at it, you can work on it, you can force it, you can grind through it, you can try to avoid it, you can take the long road, you can build it, fill it with all things the world calls impressive, you can perform for it, you can perform for God, you can people please with all your might, you can strike that rock, but you'll always end up back there dry, thirsty, and miserable. Or you can talk to the rock, ask it to release living water into the situation and into you. Push forward through a challenging situation, do what those around you are... Do what those around you are suggesting. Find someone to open up to and be real with. Take the risk. Give God a chance to show you that he is your protector and provider. Let what's going on internally match your external reality. Set, stop settling for water that comes at the end of your might. Put down the stick and lift up your praise. Put down the stick and lift up your eyes to the one who provides. Put down the stick and start trying something new. I'm pretty fired up, guys. I told you I was. I told you I was pumped to come back and preach to you guys. So I want you guys to stand with me. I want you guys to just take a second, take a little stroll to Maribah in your mind, to that one spot, two spots, three spots. Heck. I've got five Maribas. We're making a Decapolis out of this whole thing. And then look. Close your eyes and look in your mind's eye and see that stick. And see what God shows you in this moment. What, do you, what is it that you're doing in this moment that, that, that's, that's by your own might? What is it that you're doing in this, in this situation in your life that, that you're trying to strike water from the rock? How are you hindering God from releasing that living water? What do you need to speak to him about? And as a prophetic deck, I want you to lift that stick in the air and just toss it. Toss it away. And in this moment, just commit. God, I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to be patient with you about this. And anytime I come up against a rock like this, Lord, anytime I end up back in Maribel, Lord, please remind me that I threw that stick away, that I'm not going to find comfort in that rod anymore. Instead, I'm going to find comfort in you. I'm not going to try to do it the way that worked in the past just because it's familiar. I'm going to let go of all that old stuff. I'm going to let you fill me with new living water every day, Lord. Every day, Lord, I, wanna, I want you to fill me with something new for this situation. So, Lord, we just seal all this up right now in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for letting me share. Wow, wow, wow. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to invite our ministry team to come up. I just feel like, you know, there, we all have that thing that we default to, right? We all do, or several things that we default to. We're trying to hold on to our own control or, you know, and there are some things that they've worked, they've been working, but the Holy Spirit is really compelling us forward to draw us forward. He just keep, I just keep hearing him say, you can't take it with you yep. where you're going. It, you can't take it with you. So our ministry team is going to come up, Chris and Rebecca, um, Matt Hone, Alicia, who am I missing? Help me, Kristen, Karen, if she, oh, Karen's teaching the kiddos. 
Yeah. If you guys need prayer for anything, you know, if, if you haven't yet given your life to Jesus has, and made him your Lord and Savior, today is a really good day for that. Um, we'd love to join with you and, and pray with you for that. Or if you need healing in marriage, finances, relationships, whatever it is, physical healing, we'd love to join with you in prayer. Otherwise, we will see you guys next week. Love you so much.